Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'm your host for today's show and the CEO of Mary Fran Johnson Media. We produce CIO Leadership Live with the generous support of my friends and colleagues at CIO.com and the CIO Executive Council. We're streaming live to you right now on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and we welcome all of our viewers to join in today's conversation with questions of your own. We'll be watching the for those questions on the feed and passing them along to our guest. Today, I am very pleased to be joined by Nicole Raimundo, who is the Chief Information Officer of the town of Cary, North Carolina. Nicole is the principal strategist and the architect for IT and digital marketing across city government. Cary is a city of about 170,000 in the heart of Research Triangle Park near Raleigh, North Carolina. Money Magazine recently ranked it as number five on its list of best small cities in America to live and work. And the average age of the Cary citizen is 36 years old, so it's a very young population. Nicole has carved out a reputation there as an IT leader at the forefront of the Smart Cities Movement, or as she prefers to call it, the Connected Communities Movement. She's been leveraging her private sector background to fuel civic innovation in ways not previously seen in local government, most notably by piloting and implementing Internet of Things IoT technologies in the public sector. She started in the city's IT department in Raleigh in 2011 and then moved up to IT chief operating officer there and then the following year moved into the CIO's role in 2015. Before her move into the government space, Nicole spent more than 15 years in the private sector, about a decade of that at Fidelity Investments, where she was leading technology development teams in the U.S. and internationally. Nicole, welcome. It's great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Let's start out with an update on how the city and how your technology team has been adapting to the next normal that we're all living through with the pandemic. Uh, let's be honest, it's been a little busy. <laughs> so I think we're all adapting well. You know, we were very fortunate in that we were positioned um, to move remote, which is unusual for a municipality because we, we don't typically have people that work from home, right? We're all in our offices or um, out on location. So we we're very fortunate there. Um, I think the adjustment has gone well. I like to say it was instant adoption of of teams, right? Of, of all of a sudden, all of us working for video, but it's been great. I think for us, it's been busy for IT as we look to figure out how to do more of our services online and what is what is that, like you said, that new normal look like? So what do additional services look like? So I always say that, you know, IT was busy before and we're going to continue to do everything that we were doing and all of these new services. So we're we're busy and we're a small team, but we're busy, yeah. yeah. You're a small team. You have fewer than two dozen people in your IT department. There's about 28 um, in IT and another about 10 or so in marketing. So I have the marketing team under me as well. Okay. Well, so we should, but we, we can't be calling you the CIO and the chief marketing officer. <laughs> you know, you can if you want. Okay. <laughs> but well, my marketing director is phenomenal, so I'm not going to take anything away from her. Well, I always think that that's a really great combination anytime that an IT leader is deeply involved in marketing because it, it helps probably helps your own awareness and the things that you need to uh, you know tell people about what's happening in IT. Um, and you make the, a, a good point too about not being used to working remotely. Uh, when we talked earlier, you made the point that there's a lot of city services that you can't do from your home office. Uh, talk a little bit about that, about the services that have to keep going and how you how you went about that. Sure, and, and we're still working on it, right? It's it's a mm -hmm. work in progress. There are certain things we certainly need to keep keep going. I, I mean, obviously our you know, trash, recycling, utility services are going to are going to keep going. But there's things like our police records management, certainly our IT services. If you're all remote, we need to be able to provide you the right equipment, troubleshoot your computers. Um, we're also um, we think about our fleet management. So we need to keep that going in order to service uh, the fleet vehicles. And then 
there's you know parks and recreation, which is a big part of what we do at the town. Um, and figuring out what that looks like is clearly our um, you know our community centers and are closed, so we're not offering in person classes and courses. And that and that you know for our citizens, we have. Um, so we have year-round schools in, in Cary, so that's a big part of the services that we do for you know, a lot of working parents that send their kids to camp year-round, so not having that. Now we're trying to figure out what does that look like virtually? Are there other offerings? Can we offer things you know, um, in, in parks and shelters that are you know, open shelters? We're fortunate. We've got nice weather most of the year-round, so you know, it's, it's, it's just it's really thinking um, you know, I don't like to use outside of the box, but it really is thinking about doing things differently than mm -hmm. we have before. Yeah. Well, I know I was reading your bio and some of your background, and I know we'll get into talking about innovation and approaches to it later, but I was, of course, I, my, uh, my interest snagged on the fact that you describe yourself as a government rebel. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that and how that's a good thing for a CIO. Sure. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate in, in, you know, where I work that I get a lot of leeway to try and test things. But I will say five years ago, um, when I, you know, came to the town, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have Wi-Fi in our buildings, right? There was the hardest working people I've ever seen. And we deliver services at um, a level I've never witnessed before. Mm -hmm. And um, they just, they just didn't know what they didn't know. Okay. So, right. So staff just didn't know that technology, we could have automation, we could mm -hmm. move around our buildings with laptops, you know. Um, so there was a lot of trying to get the town to adopt what that would look like and adopt innovation. So it was this change in culture. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we did a lot of, I think, the things that traditionally people do with hackathons and inviting folks in that were not IT, right? Because we really just needed ideas and it was all about the ideas and how to streamline process. And with that, we really came up with that brand around GovRebel. It was something that people could cling onto and feel a part of and be like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna be a little bit of rebel. I'm gonna test this out. I'm gonna push the boundaries. You know, one of the ways I think we did that was, um, you know, we turned our campus into a living lab. I'm mm -hmm. sure we'll talk about that a little bit, but it's ways to keep pushing and um, innovating and then not being afraid of people, um, you know, thinking, you know, what is she doing, right? You know, <laughs> a little bit taking those risks, but having the thick skin to be like, okay, just bear with me. You'll see it at the end, but yeah. Well, and, and uh, the, it's a little surprising almost to hear that because you're talking about 2015, 2016, you, you were coming yeah. into this role, and Raleigh is kind of the Silicon Valley area of North Carolina. I mean, you've got very big vendors nearby. SAS Institute is one of the very big employers in that area. You would think, uh, and such a young population, uh, you would think it just hadn't, it just hadn't gotten to city government yet. Yeah, I, you know, I, again, I think it was just people just didn't know what they didn't know. And there was lots of, I remember with the, you know, the Wi-Fi, I share the story with, um, you know, one of our assistant town managers, who's now deputy, um, couldn't understand why we would want, you know, Wi-Fi in our campuses and in our other buildings, you know, but obviously buildings all around the town. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember talking to him and being like, well, Russ, when you go home at night, like we all work at night, you know, whether it's check email, whatever. It's like, well, how do you do that? Like, do you do it from your kitchen island? Do you have an office? Do you sit on the couch? And I think he said to his island, and I was like, wow. I'm like, you must have a really long Ethernet cord. And he's <laughs> like, no, I'm on my home Wi-Fi. And I was like, exactly. exactly. You know? And so it's really that thinking about how we use, whether it's our smartphone, right? our devices and, and transforming that and thinking about whatever we use in our normal lives, we should be utilizing in work. And that's really the expectation that we have in delivering services to our community.
Great. Well, let's talk about what some of your priorities are today as the IT leader there versus six months. Now, I guess it's eight months ago with the pandemic. What what has shifted up or down your own list in terms of the things that you're paying most attention to every week? Sure. Uh, I mean, lots of things have shifted. Um, obviously, we do lots of virtual meetings. Sure. Um, and virtual meetings for us is are, are there's various different flavors. Right, so there's our council meetings, which is a production that we need to do and figure out how to bring our um, staff in, whether remotely for that. Mm -hmm. And then there's figuring out uh, parks and recreation, what does virtual programming look like? You know, how do I do a arts class or a dance class or whatever it may be uh, virtually? And then as well as meetings. So all of those take, um, they have very different needs. And you would think that it was similar. It just, you know, let's just use whatever, team, WebEx or Zoom, and that's really not um, not gonna work for us. So that's a big need for us. And I don't think that's going away because I think we're gonna always offer uh, virtual classes. Um, putting Wi-Fi in um, our public locations, so under shelters and parks was on our list. It's been on the list and we've been incrementally doing it, but it's moved up. Yes. So we're hoping that that can be a service we can provide to our, our community so maybe they can take their kids to the park and one can work on their homework and the other can mm -hmm. run around, whatever it may be. And then just really thinking about delivering of services differently. So we, you know, we now have um, a system that's used in retail, right? Like a queuing system and time to pick up system, whether it's for you need to come in and get a monitor or a device, but we're also using it now for our police records so that um, we don't, our buildings aren't open, but if you want to come and schedule it, okay. they will come out to the curb. So we're doing all sorts of curbside delivery. Yeah. Um, same thing with our fleet management. We certainly don't want a bunch of people waiting in a room for their cars to right. be serviced. So if you think about the way to deliver services and um, you know schedule time, to come in and be able in a queuing system, mm -hmm. um, like you see in retail or even really airlines. So we've implemented that type of solution, which is really not something you would ever sort of think of in a, a government. But then once you kind of start thinking about it, you're like, okay, and when our buildings open, we'll do it for permits and inspections. So the people will feel safe coming in. So mm -hmm. if we can say you're next in line, show up in 20 minutes, you can get a text message, come on in. And just so we can not only track how many people are in the building, but do it in a safe manner that our citizens feel safe coming in. And we want to be able to deliver our services to them, certainly. So. Well, you had an interesting story about when you actually thought of that. You were in your car and you were driving by a big retailer. That is true. I was driving by a big retailer. This was early on, so it was probably end of March, right? Early April. And it was raining. Um, and there's, you know, I think we've all seen the big lines right out the door. Yeah. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, it is 2020. There has got to be a better solution. There is no reason that anybody <laughs> needs to wait in these lines. And, he, and you still see it a little bit today and, you know, hoping we won't see it anymore. But um, yeah. I think about that, you know, using those solutions all the time because the technology is there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Do you think, is it, has it been easier to be a government rebel and to be yeah. innovative now that there's a lot more open-mindedness uh, just from citizens, consumers, from your own staff, probably from your city council. Yeah, for 100% for sure. Okay. And I will say when we, um, when we start to learn about, you know, IOT and, you know, I like to call it connected communities mm -hmm. and um, turned our campus into a lab. I mean, lots of people in the town were like, what are you wasting your time on? Because IOT just seemed so far away from the work we were doing. Um, and they really didn't understand it. And I remember we, uh, one of the solutions we tested, I call them the hockey pucks, but they're the little sensors that go in the parking. Mm -hmm. And we did that in one of our surface lots um, in a community center. And um, so we could uh, not only see how many people are there, but the community center is also used for voter voting and Veterans Day events and all of these things. So there's lots of um, handicap spots that we would want to add or remove based on 
right? What we could see through the data. And then I remember, you know, one day, and it was probably, I'm going to tell you, it was at least a year later. <laughs> you know, I heard someone else talking about, we were looking at um, the zip cars and where to put, where to possibly put one mm -hmm. and track it. And they're like, we could put one of those parking sensors in there. Right? And all of a sudden you're like, okay, they're, they're actually getting it, you know? How did, take us back to the beginning of that, when um, the, the IoT and using sensors in places that people hadn't thought of it before, how did you approach that? Did you have a, I, I know city governments, I used to cover them as a reporter years ago in Florida and Ohio, and um, you, you usually have a task force, you know, as soon as mm -hmm. someone comes you approach it especially especially in a government situation and in the midst of probably lockdown and you know it's um you know it's interesting to think about the iot space and that we started it you know four i would say four years ago and mm -hmm. it was really in its infancy and you think it's now you think it's been around for a while but it was really in its infancy and again, we've talked about where Cary is located. We are very fortunate to be in an area that's got fantastic universities mm -hmm. and startups and nonprofits and obviously um, big corporate uh, players that could help us. And we really did put together a task force um, with some of our vendors, you know, such as Cisco. We work with a nonprofit called NC Riot that does startups for IoT and education around it and our educational partners. And then we also had a company um, move from Silicon Valley and to Cary that mm -hmm. does lighting um, controls and other things and mesh networks um, called Trilliant and kind of brought people in the room and were like, how do we figure this out together? Right, knowing like we didn't, certainly did not know it all or knew very little and we leveraged those partners to do it and the great Great thing about that is that, um, you know, especially early on with Cisco, is they were learning from us as much as we were learning from them. And it was a great partnership when we came up with the concept of allowing folks to bring their technologies to town hall. Mm -hmm. And we built a, um, a contract that stated it was either going to be at zero or very little cost. So that was a big selling point to council and everybody else um, but it did also give us a mechanism to purchase if we wanted to at right. the end of the trial so we have you know we've got things from you know uh, we've got iot rodent traps that Bayer crop science have put on campus because they needed a place to try it and so we've just we've got an array of different um sensing technologies that we've tested out and we've learned a tremendous amount about it so it wasn't so much about we needed a parking solution or we needed a lighting control solution. It was about learning how it worked, learning what was going to end up being the right architecture for us to build. What mm -hmm. is security going to look like? What is ingestion of data? And why does everybody have their own dashboard yeah. you know, and their own analytics? Yeah. And learned very quickly that the last thing we wanted to do was support, you know, another 30 siloed um, applications. And so we already had a platform strategy in place and this just really fed into it. And so we've built out a really great um, platform architecture for our, um, for our IoT mm -hmm. um, applications and other applications that I think, you know, for us is not only gonna be great for today, but in the future, because now it's really easy for us to add sensors. That's the easy part once you get the infrastructure correct. <clears throat> it reminds me a little bit of the early days of the RFID tags. Yeah. Remember when we, we used to have to explain that and spell it out and tell people what they meant and that sort of thing. And now I, you basically see them on everything. We're probably heading, we're probably well along the road to that happening with IoT. Yeah, I mean, I say that all the time, you know, we have a, um, We've got a committee internally that is made up of representation from all the departments, which is incredibly important. It's mm -hmm. important not only for education, but also um, learning and products, because you just said it. I mean, the end of the day, I would, and not too far distant enough, I think all projects are going to have an IoT component. When we think about transportation, public works, you know, all of the things that we do, um, I really believe they're going to have an IoT component. And now that we've got this committee 
and you can see the wheels spinning yeah. and the ideas that they come up with. And they're also really understanding how, um, how everything that we do in the organization is connected. And I know we like to all think that we work in, you know, I work in IT, someone works in public works, someone works in finance, someone works in permits and inspections. But when you start developing a use case, mm -hmm. quickly realize <clears throat> you touch every, almost every single department. Sure. And then being able to automate that and use the data and using technology, um, it's pretty amazing. It makes things so much more transparent between the silos. You know, people may okay. still work in their silos, but they can actually see and understand what's happening in the others. Um, we have a question from our alert audience. How does the priority of security change with this new approach for you? Okay, well, I tell you what, security has always been a priority for us. Um, you know, we were actually, was for, it was, I think it was a little bit of luck of, of timing for us. So every year, you know, I think we do what most companies do with, um, we have a security program that does uh, phishing technologies, which is really email and people mm -hmm. opening things is the biggest uh, risk for us. And I will say probably any company, it's usually internal. And so we were in the process of doing that when we went remote. Mm -hmm. um, we work very closely also with the state on cybersecurity. Um, we've, mm -hmm. our area recently, not Carrie, I wish I had some wood to knock on, has, mm -hmm. has been endured some challenges with um, threats, but that's always our priority, you know, it's, and I think it's everyone's, and I know in a little bit of a way, it seems a little bit like a cop out of an answer, but it is number one. Yeah, well, and, um... We have another question, and this is our, our listening audience is very interested to hear you talk about some of your innovations. We had, and we just, we skimmed quickly over the fact that you have the living lab, but take us back on that story and talk about how that got going and what that actually means, because I think that's the wellspring of a lot of your innovation. You know, it, 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 it certainly is. Um, and the idea behind it too was that, you know, Carrie, we talked about, so I guess maybe small to mid sized city, 170,000. We talked about we don't have a lot of resources, but we want it to be a model for others to be able to follow. That was important for us. Whatever we wanted to build, we wanted it to be repeatable anywhere because often people think that, um, you know, innovation and technology and IoT comes from Chicago, New York, the big cities. Well, there's a lot more carries yeah. than there are the big major cities. Okay. And so it was really important for us to figure that out. And we looked at our campus, um, which is several buildings. Um, we've got a parking deck, a community center. Obviously, we've got all the, the um, trash recycling. We actually have a tower. So we had... Um, I would say almost everything that we have in the town just on a micro scale. Yeah. And so it allowed us to utilize that space to test technologies. They weren't, it was never designed to say, we're going to test this because we're going to widely distribute it. Although we did learn a lot, like the, the hockey putts, we will never do that again, right? <laughs> in our parking decks, it's just better technology now. Yeah. So we learned a lot through that. Um, and we learned it was something that others could do if you, again, at very little cost, mm -hmm. if any. And that also was really important because the, not only the learnings that we did, but doing it at a scale that um, was little cost that we could purchase if we wanted to also gave us a lot of credibility with our council um, so that when we did ask for money and yeah. we, and we have, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, they knew how thoughtful that we were, right? And that we weren't saying, hey, we need whatever money to do, um, let's say parking or lighting or whatever. It, they understood we had gone through all the trials and testing and, and looked at vendors and worked with partners and really spent a lot of time understanding what that looks like. So I would say if anyone's gonna do that, it's a critical component. Yeah. Um, the other thing for us is um, we also have a greater understanding of um, how we all live, work, play, and the amazing region that we live in. 
-hmm. And so when we look at projects right now, we have a um, a stormwater project that we're using IoT sensors for um, alerting, which were helpful last week because it rained a lot. Um, I was going to ask you more about that because that you have one of your vendor collaboration stories is very yeah. simple to how that all got developed. But I just had one other follow-up question. You talked about the things you're developing in the living lab. You wanted it to be available and, and people aware of it. Do you mean other city governments could do the same? Or are you talking about just the general consumers? I mean, how do you, how do people find out about what you're developing in the living lab? Yeah. Definitely other city governments. And we have invited many in, many have come by to see how it works. We have shared, it's, you know, it's no secret. We want others to learn because we understand that the value in this technology is not just for Carrie, it's for everyone, right? We're all, this just happened to be our citizens in our community, but we would certainly want the same everywhere else. And again, it was really important for us because um, I think the mindset, because the folks, you know, that came out first with, um, lighting and all these other things were the big cities. They were Chicago, they were New York City. And I think the rest of us felt like, how do we do this, um, you know, with very little money and how do we figure it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, well, let's, um, let's loop back for just one second. We had another question from the audience about security and they wondered whether you had had any incidents that you had to deal with, um, if there was anything that you've been confronted with in the last several months, given the whole new working from home situation that everybody's in. So again, I'm gonna, I need some wood to knock on. We have been very fortunate. We have not. And I, and I tell you, I don't know if we've trained our employees and um, very well, uh, especially from the email side that we get questions all the time from them about, mm -hmm this looks suspicious. I think they're scared to click on anything, which is good. That we've definitely seen um, yeah. <laughs> an increase in threats from the outside, but we do have a, a really robust system. And, you know, I'm very thankful at the moment that we have been able to maintain um, our security. Okay. Okay, good. Well, I just, I can always see whenever I ask CIOs about security, it's that that fine line. You don't want to you don't want to suddenly become a target because I feel you like I'm jinxing myself, right? Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> it's a very commonplace reaction with CIOs everywhere, and I think that the um, uh, the way all of us as consumers and citizens have become more aware of it. I spot things on my own phone all the time, but even as aware of it as I am, and, and I happen that my husband is extremely technically savvy, I nearly started filling something in the other day because it, it's gotten very sophisticated. And you know, we have, the other thing too is, and I, I don't know whether other, I mean, obviously we're a municipality, but we, um, we also partner with our police department too, right? So um, several times a year, we'll partner cybersecurity with general safety. So this time of year with shopping and online shopping and in store shopping, um, we'll do a lot of work around um, sharing information on that, what it looks like, what to be aware, mm -hmm. um, what you should be looking for. We do the same thing around like tax season. There's a couple other times a year where it seems to go high that there's a lot of scams. And and yeah. so we, we do do, a, I feel like we do a pretty good job with that for sure. Well, and that ties in too to um, the marketing function of the city. And I, I tell us a little bit more about how you ended up playing such a significant role in the digital marketing. Yeah, I won the lottery. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's fascinating. I think, you know, um, I coming from private sector and then going into public sector, I could never really understand why municipalities didn't have a marketing department. Because essentially you're marketing all your services. You want companies to come to your town city, right? Mm -hmm. And they were, um, I feel like it was a little you know, old school. So it was still the public information office where you would get news releases or a press release. Yeah. And we brought in a new uh, town manager mm -hmm. and who's awesome. And, you know, he kind of had that same philosophy that I did and gave me the opportunity to have a marketing department mm -hmm. that could help with really marketing our services um, 
to the community, but also really upping our game, I think, in terms of communication. So when you think about text messaging, two-way text messaging, social media, even our website, you know, um, web apps, all of that kind of crosses worlds, right? Can, like your web department can either be put in IT or communications. And why not just have it under one roof, right? So that we're able to share. So it's been extraordinary for me. And it's been actually great for our tech team too. You know, they are very good at use case design, very good at helping us model things out, thinking through it. Um, you know, we have, um, for example, we've got an Alexa skill and a Google, I don't know if they call it a skill, Mm -hmm. But how would you market that, right? I mean, you need yeah. someone that puts a campaign behind that, that helps educate yeah. in your community. Mm -hmm. I know, because a lot of really the best marketing is really education. It's showing people something. I, somebody quoted this to me years ago, and I love it as an expression that great marketing is uh, showing people what they never knew they always wanted. Uh, or or needed or were already using and didn't realize. Um, I wanted to also loop back. You had mentioned the um, collaborative approach you took to the whole stormwater issue. For those of us that don't have the water problems that some of the southern states have, t tell me what that was all about. And you had quite a confab where you brought together a lot of very big vendors and partners uh, on their own dime to help you solve it. So tell us that story. <laughs> you know, we are a community, we are a municipality, we don't have a million resources and tons of money, but we do have really great partners. Mm -hmm. we and we were embarking on our um, IoT storm stormwater um, project, and we really needed to figure out how all of the pieces work together. And we we had some idea, we know, but we're not we're not experts. Like I'm not afraid to admit, I'm not an expert, right? So I'm gonna go ask the best of the best. Sure. And um, we have great relationship with our partners and we came up with the concept of having a two-day workshop okay. in which we brought in um, we brought in Salesforce, we brought in their chief IoT person. We brought in Del Boomi CTO. We brought in um, some folks from Microsoft in their IoT space, and then um, SaaS for the analytics. And we spent two days with my team and um, others in the town really mapping it out. Uh, we very fortunately also work with a um, innovation professor. Uh, he's at NC State and teaches in Harvard. And, he took over and helped kind of modeling it out. He couldn't, you know, couldn't sit there. And, you know, it was an interesting, um, it was very interesting as you could sit back and watch it because you had these big players of vendors that certainly can tell you, and they certainly, and their products certainly can do it all. Mm -hmm. And we were asking them to leave their ego at the door. Um, also, as you mentioned, come on their own dime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, come on their own dime and help us build this out. So they had to figure out and work together on what piece would do the, was right, right? So whether um, it was Del Boomi doing the alerting, you know, it was kind of figuring out, mapping out the technology and the architecture. What was the problem you were trying to solve? What were they building out? So, oh, I'm sorry. So they're building out an alerting system for um, stormwater so that when the, I forgot, we had the sensor company there too, um, Greenstream. I don't want to forget them because they're a startup, local startup. Um, so the, the, from the alerting of the sensor levels to then triggering um, one and alert for the sensor level, then um, if it reached a certain threshold, a work order. Mm -hmm. So going into our CRM, which is Salesforce, uh, to our public works, Okay. And potentially our police department, depending on where it was. So we would either need to close a street, um, also maybe redirect traffic if there's a signal there. Also yeah. perhaps send the information to Waze. Um, we also wanted to um, send it into our social studio, which is our communication tool to send out notifications and um, 
build an analytics, build a model, an analytics model mm -hmm. around the stormwater so that eventually um, we could go from the, the reactive phase, which we are today, because, well, we're not, because now it's in place. But, you know, we often didn't find out that a street was flooded unless we either had trucks driving around from public works yeah. or a citizen alerted us. Okay. So we've moved from that reactive, right, to the proactive. And then with the modeling, we would, our hope is to get to the predictive. Mm -hmm. But at the end of um, that two days, when we sat in a room, all of us in a room together, and we actually, you know, could mock the data from the alerting and see it go all the way through the system. Mm -hmm. Like that was pretty remarkable <laughs> to see two full days of vendors getting together to figure out what this could look like. And not just, and it was, so, so stormwater was the use case, but the mm -hmm. architecture, right, was gonna be for everything. Okay. Right, so other IoT um, projects. So, you know, um, when you have really good partnerships, it is amazing what you can get people <laughs> to come together and collaborate to do. Now, maybe it's because we're a community and there's some good, there is some goodwill in there, but they're also all trying to figure this out together. And they all wanted to be a part of this because they understood the value of what we were delivering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're companies, they know that then if they get this right here, they can go sell it somewhere else, which, right, right? good for you. I think that's great. Um, ask you if you've heard from other city CIOs who want to know more about it or maybe want to know how you got this all set up. Yeah, I do get questions all the time about how did you get them to come and how did you get them to come for free? And I'm like, well, did you ask? That's often how you start. You'd be surprised what you get if you just ask. It is a two-way relationship, right? We're happy to share their the story of the success that we're working with them because they are a part of our ecosystem and they truly are partners with us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're all learning the space together. I think that there's ways that you can definitely do this work. Um, you do have to get a little bit creative. This was a creative way for us to do it. But man, we banged out, you know, something in two days that would have taken my team and maybe some contractors months months and had the experts there to help us figure it out. So we're very fortunate. Now, um, since you are kind of at the, with the heartbeat of the digital marketing and you're in touch with citizens through that role, as well as your CIO role, are you, what would you say about the changing, the citizen or customer expectations that you're, that you mm. see now, especially in the midst of the pandemic, when I think we're all paying more attention to that? Yeah, I, you know, for, I, so for us, and I think other um, municipalities, communication has been really key. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with the changes every, every day, right? There's a press conference, I don't want to say quite daily, but often enough of the changes of closure times, right? What the, how many people can be outside together? How many can be inside? Mm -hmm. and finding ways to message that um, positively, yeah. um, right? Because it, it's impacting everyone. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, that's a lot of work that that team does and goes through. We um, actually had a really, I wish I could show it to you. We had a really creative sign about um, the six feet apart and we used a dinosaur and a lightsaber and, all these different things. And it, and it actually went viral. So it was kind of funny. So we were like, look at us, um, you know, that we put on our greenways and trails and everything. So lots of ways to communicate that um, seem a little bit more upbeat. Yes, yes. Well, I was just thinking about dinosaur size. I'm, which dinosaur? There were some of them that are... <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Probably something where you'd need an eight-year-old to help you and say, oh, we need to be a stegosaurus or. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. We have, um, so we have sensors on our, our greenways and our trails. And, we've, and Carrie has over 80 miles of greenways that run behind neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And it has been fascinating to watch the spike of people outside on the trails, mm -hmm. um, which, which then, gives us the opportunity to increase our marketing 
of information that we want to share because we know that there's all these people on the on mm. the trails. Yeah. Now, and when we were talking about the stormwater project, was that part of the Living Lab? Uh, it was not. It was done after. Okay, that was something. Tell us more about what's happening in the Living Lab <clears throat> right now and what sort of things are you looking at getting into over the next year, especially since we'll probably still be doing it under, you know, social distancing uh, restrictions. Yeah. Well, the Living Lab is kind of hanging out by itself at the moment since nobody's on campus. But, um, <laughs> but um, I think we'll continue to try test different technologies out there. We've got um, partnership with NC State around some drone stuff that we're working through. Oh. For us, for future though, is um, we are actually working with our region. So our stormwater is actually the, um, and we're partway there. Um, it's very important for us to be able to share that information to our community. So we're at the top of the stream, Raleigh's uh, carries at the top of the stream base. And, and we all know that um, water knows no boundaries. And so we have worked hard with um, the county and Raleigh and the state and some other municipalities to come up with a format into sharing data, um, which sounds, easy. It is not <laughs> getting people to think about how to share data and um, not having to worry about relinquishing something yeah. um, was a big hurdle to get over, but we did get there. And so we've got a template to do that. And we're sharing our data um, right now with the, the state, but we can share it down to Raleigh and they can consume it any way they want. So the idea is that we don't care how they, how they get their water data. So I don't, if it's whatever kind of sensor, none of that matters. It's just the ability to share. And there's a big push um, one for me personally, because I think of this, um, I don't think of it as just carry. I think of it as a region. We yeah. all, I think about the way I go to, well, I'm not going to work right now, but the way, um, you know, I go to work and where I shop and where my kids go to school and where I take them for hockey practice. And it's not all within the boundaries of Carrie. And I think my life is much like everybody else's life. Mm -hmm. So the value of IoT is to, is to not do it in isolation, mm -hmm. right? It's to think about how do we, how do, we do mobility as a region, mm -hmm. right? Because we're traveling. It's great that we can control traffic lights and we can do things in, in Carrie. And we've got preemption for our emergency vehicles, but what if we could do this as a region, right? Right. Because that's really where you start to get the value of IoT is when it's done on a regional. And I mean, ideally, right, the whole United States would be, you know, some sort of connected and value there. But um, it's so it's really important for us to think of it better on a regional level. We understand we've got RTP. We certainly want to bring as many more amazing companies to the region that we can. Yeah. Uh, we understand they're going to live in different places and, and work. So that's really a passion for us is to figure things out um, on a regional level. And I will say this area is very good about collaborating. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, because many of the things you're talking about remind me of some conversations I've had with CIOs of other big public, like airport CIOs, mm -hmm. that need to essentially track the information flow all the way through, like to find out if someone's coming to the airport, you know, are they okay? Yeah. Have they been exposed to COVID? And to pass that information along, um, which makes me think about different emerging technology trends. Uh, one of the things, I, and I always ask CIOs about this, blockchain technologies. Is there anything about that that you are watching in particular? I know the IoT sensors are very high on your radar, but what about some of the other, especially the things around data? Yeah, we've definitely looked into it. We haven't, we have not found a really solid use case for us. Um, for every time I've heard that, because I'd be a multimillionaire. No one really seems to have that quite yet. Yeah, I think the county may have a better shot at it because, you know, they're really the holders of real estate um, and human and health services. So I think there's 
some things there that could definitely use blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, I know the state has been looking at a few things. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. We haven't, we keep waiting to find, like we're like, we want to find a good use case, but. I know. Well, maybe it's a, like we started out 10 years ago, RFID tags were a novelty. Right. Five years ago, IoT was a novelty. I, to many, I do know one or two CIOs in some very specific industries that are doing really interesting things with blockchain to track information, but they do tend to be niche, you know, like um, um, people that uh, like Bumblebee Foods, I know, uses blockchain in a very interesting way to track the catches all the way from the ocean to the restaurant table. And I've talked with uh, CIOs at art museums that have been using it to track provenance on the different photos. I feel like eventually all of this will come together in a big muddle, but I guess it maybe it's like, seems more like a muddle now. Let us, we've been mentioning kind of on a, you know, like peripherally all the great people that you've been able to work with and your staff and all that. Let's talk about talent acquisition. I know you have a, you have a small, you know, under 30 people in your IT department. So the partnerships are absolutely critical. Um, how do you, are you recruiting right now? How do you train people? Uh, do you have specialists or does everyone need to wear multiple hats? What? I think we all wear multiple hats. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this summer was, I will say it was a huge loss for me personally, because I, um, we have a, an intern program, uh, mostly of high school students and some college students. So a few of the high schools around here have technology tracks and in order for them to graduate, they need experience. I think it's, I, I, I wanna say 1100 hours, but don't hold me to that. Mm -hmm. And we've had up to 10 at a time come in for the summers. And it just had a whole new vibe to the organization, right? Mm -hmm. um, just they're, in, they're just really inquisitive. They're super sharp, by the way. Like I encourage everyone, hire some high school kids. Like I have been blown away. We also have um, a few college students that are incredibly sharp. Mm -hmm. We have... Um, one of our interns was with, he's been with us for four years. So he's graduated high school, then he graduated Wake Tech Community College, and he's now over at NC State. And that's really part of the pipeline that we want to bring in, right? We want to get these kids in, get them real experience, let them learn, and hopefully they'll stay with us. We work with, um, Wake Tech has a great um analytics program where they teach SAS. And we um, had an intern that was um, a mother that was returning to work. Wonderful. So she uh, was quite older. Um, and the, she was, she just left us, but she had been with us for, I think, three years. And so um, if an intern means no age, the way I look at it and they're learning, but it, they are um, a great pipeline for talent for us and obviously the universities. We're, we've been doing a little bit of hiring. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit strange doing the, the uh, interviews over, uh, over video, but yeah, I, I think leveraging the resources around you and especially the universities and the schools is a tremendous way to bring in talent you know, for us, um, it's not always easy. People don't, <laughs> they find this hard to believe, but not everybody in technology is immediately drawn to government. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it still has that little bit of a connotation of old school, which it is, which it's not. And then, you know, once they come in, they're amazed at the technology that they have. And because we are small and yep. nimble, it means you get your hands on a lot of different technologies and you can try things and learn them. I love lifelong learners. So I would put money into training anyone any day, as long as there are, you know, someone that's going to be willing to put in the effort and wants to learn. Yeah. Well, I tend to, I ask this question a lot of different CIOs and no matter what size company or what industry, I hear a lot more talk now about 
critical thinking skills and collaboration and emotional intelligence. And I don't hear anybody saying they need the latest certification from Microsoft or Cisco. All of that stuff is completely gettable. Um, but it's that, and you also have something you have going for you in government is mission-based. It's like healthcare companies, government organizations. And, uh, you know, my, uh, my daughter works for um, a, you know, she works for the state of New Jersey in addiction psychiatry. And for her, it's all about the mission. And I think it's, uh, you had mentioned that when you came out of, you know, you were at Fidelity Investments and, mm -hmm. and big private industry, and you seem quite happy to have your hands on a bigger, a bigger steering wheel, essentially, with the city. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you can see the impact of your work and it, you know, it's funny, we just had this conversation when you were talking about mission-based um, with Veterans Day last week. Um, I actually have a, a fairly large percentage of um, military folks that were hired, which may seem a little bit random, but I think it's that mission, mm -hmm. right? You know, and they're drawn to the work of the doing good and, um, they are, I was, I was bragging about them the other day because they're, they're, they're not your nine to five folks. You know, no. they're your, your team that's literally no man left behind. They're yeah. going to work till they get something right. They're never going to talk negative about somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I recommend um, that path as well if anybody's looking to hire, but yeah. Students hire veterans, yes. yes. Go for the mission-based. Well, let us, uh, oh, I have one more question before we'll do our wrap up about leadership. Do, are there any particular IT trends that you see impacting your organization in the near term? Anything oh, you see going on? Is that an interesting question? Yes. You know, I don't, I don't know if it's so much um, trends. I think, it'll, I think um, it'll be interesting what happens with 5G and how we can leverage that. You know, we've got, a, we have, uh, we're building a brand new park downtown, a very um, expensive park that I'm hoping will be instrumented very well with, with technology. So I think that will be a, a, could potentially be a game changer, especially as we think about IoT beyond, you know, the carry walls and we move out. I think that could be interesting. Um, so that's probably the one that I'm really going to watch. Interested and in. good. Well, we mentioned dinosaurs before. You probably don't be Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> let's talk about uh, let's talk about leadership lessons. I always like to wrap up with a few words of encouragement, advice, uh, things you like to pass along when you're bringing when you're mentoring people on your own staff about just kind of balancing all the competing demands on the CIO role. And in just the five or, well, five or eight years that you've been in city government, you've seen the CIO role evolve into so much broader in some areas and so much deeper than it used to be in others. So uh, share with us, you know, you're, you're, you're a very young CIO, but share with us lessons and things that you like to pass along to others yeah I, really for me it is about um and I think we talked about it it is about one being okay with failing mm -hmm. being okay with taking risks and really supporting your team and letting them lead giving them the opportunities to lead and grow and supporting them um, it's amazing what will happen when you nudge people along and give them the opportunity and say, it's okay. Uh, you know, we're not going to let you fail. you you will be fine. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are really good things to look at to make sure that you're taking care of your people. Cause at the end of the day, I'm one person. So it's really not me. It's the team behind me, right. That's, that's really helping. Mm -hmm. And so you need to work really hard um, at building that team and taking care of them and giving them the opportunities to shine. You know, I, I say all the time, nobody wants to hear me talk all the time. Let somebody else, it's time for somebody else to shine. So I think it's about looking back and pulling and pulling the others up. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. It Thanks was for having me. It's really fascinating hearing about everything you have going on in Cary. And I was envying your wonderful weather. I'm up in the Boston. <laughs> And it's already pretty cold here. But then when I heard about the flooding and the storm waters, I thought, well, every region has its challenges. So it is true. It yeah. is true. 
Well, it's been great having you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Oh, thank you. And if you joined us late today, you can watch the full episode later on today on CIO.com or on YouTube. And please take a moment to subscribe to IDG Tech Talk on the YouTube channel, uh, which is where you can not only see my conversation today with Nicole, but the other 50 plus interviews that we've done on CIO Leadership Live for the last three years. I hope you enjoyed the conversation today with CIO Nicole Ramundo of uh, the city of Cary, North Carolina, and that you will come back and join us for our next episode. We'll be back in two weeks, and I will be joined on Wednesday, December 2nd, again at high noon Eastern time, by CIO Kendra Ketchum, who's with the University of Texas in San Antonio. Thanks so much for tuning in, to, to, in today, and thanks again to my friends and colleagues at CIO.com and the CIO Executive Council for their continuing sponsorship of this CIO Leadership Live. Stay safe and well out there, and we'll see you back here next time.